What a wonderful opportunity we have had this whole day to meditate on this wonderful celebration of the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. We heard so much in the morning, and this, there's so much more that could be said. We'll never be able to go into the whole depth of this wonderful celebration because this is the beginning of the Passion Week of Jesus Christ. The, Everything he lived for happened during this week between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, which would be next week. We heard how Jesus entered into Jerusalem and wept over this city. And I actually wanted to start off our meditation by thinking about the same passage that was already read from Matthew 23, 37 through 39. These are the same verses we heard about, but... After we read these verses, we will we'll make our way to the rest of the chapter and the, above to, to get the context, to get the reason why Jesus really wept and why was his heart so broken and grieved over Jerusalem and what was he really feeling as we'll read the whole chapter or parts of the whole chapter. So Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See your houses left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus wept over Jerusalem. The other time we see him weeping was over Lazarus' death when he saw the devastating impacts of sin on humanity that a man that was not yet an old man died suddenly and who was his friend and he wept over him. But here he weeps over Jerusalem because they did not recognize the time of their visitation. They missed their visitation. That's what the morning uh, we heard in the morning. And then we know that Jesus went into the temple and flipped all the money changers, uh, benches, and everything that they were doing to make a profit because he said, Jesus said, this is a house of worship, and you made it into a den of robbers. He, cha- he wanted the worshipers to freely come and worship the Lord God, their, his Father. So God's heart grieves not so much over disease or politics, how people, politicians often lie, or about even wars that happen. The, the thing that grieves God's heart the most is religious hypocrisy. And that's why he wept over Jerusalem so much, because he was offering the people something much more than anything that they could ever do on their own, and they denied, they rejected the offer of salvation. What grieves God's heart the most is when people claim to know God and live a lifestyle that rejects him and pushes other people from God. And we know that Jesus, a few days before he died, he actually said his final public sermon. If you're If you read the Bible, if you read Matthew, you'll know that one of his first sermons was the Sermon on the Mount. When he started his ministry, he said a a really wonderful sermon that everybody strives to live by. And in in the beginning of that uh, sermon is the Beatitudes, the eight Beatitudes. And as we read in verse uh, chapter 23, we will see the eight woes of this uh, ch- chapter that Jesus gives to the Pharisees, to the religious people, or anybody who claims to be able to be good enough to reach God on their own, not just those Pharisees, but anybody who rejects Jesus Christ, he gives these woes to them also. So the title of my message today is Choose Either Blessings or curse- Curses. Choose Either Blessings or curses, because remember when Moses was dying, his final words was, I have said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life so that you may live. Choose life, and in Jesus Christ, we can choose life. The only 
choice that really matters is what you do with Jesus Christ, whether he is just a political deliverer as those people that were proclaiming him that day, they wanted him to deliver them from Roman oppression, or do you realize that he's the only way to salvation, that the only one that can save you? So we, we will try to look at these eight woes and the eight beatitudes, the eight blessings of chapter 5 and compare them and see how interestingly they tie in together, how Jesus doesn't say an, uh, in his final sermon, he doesn't give another call to repentance. He gives a very strict rebuke to the Pharisees, to those that do not want to accept him. So I'm just going to look at the first one. First thing is that he says, Woe to those who shut heaven's door and blessings to those who humbly enter. So the first one is, Woe to those who shut heaven's door and blessings to those who humbly enter in. So that's verse 13, chapter 23, 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. We know that the Jewish people were supposed to be a beacon of light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to be light to those other nations that, in seeing how Israel li lives, how they worship God, and that other people would draw near and want to have the same relationship with God. But after time, they began to serve idols, and they, they kept their religions going, but they had no knowledge of God because they, they were so into just the mechanics of what they needed to do in bringing the offering, but not in the heart, which that's what God always wants from us. And uh, they were meant to be a doorkeeper so that people will see and enter into the presence of God. That's what Israel was meant to be. And as I read this passage, the, the thing that comes to my mind is Mordecai in the book of Esther, Remember, there was two doorkeepers in that story that wanted to kill the king. And the king was not an Israelite. He was a Gentile king. But Mordecai, being a Jew, he was careful to warn the Esther about those two that wanted to kill him. And his life was saved. So one might say, why was a Jew so careful to save the life of a king who was a Gentile? But that's what God intended uh, the Israel, Israelites to do, is always to be a light to the Gentiles. And so Mordecai, in a sense, was a true gatekeeper because he uh, saved the life of the king. So the Jews were supposed to lead the Gentiles to God. And we know that Jesus says, I am the door, and nobody enters in except through me. So Jesus is the door. So now let's look at the beatitude. The Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see the correlation between these two? The kingdom of heaven. Those Pharisees are blocking them from entering to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says in 5, 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because they will enter the kingdom of heaven. The humble will have access to the door in opposition to the rich uh, in, in, in their own spirit who do not need to and, and think they are good in their own spirit, that they think they can go to God on their own merits. And the humble says, I have nothing to offer you, but the proud will say, what I do is good enough. And there's, so the, the, the religious people will say, do, do, and do. They say, do this and do that, but faith in Jesus says, it is done. It is done. What is done? Because Jesus said, it is finished. There's nothing else we can add to it. So that was the first one. Second one is, woe to those who steal from the poor and blessings to those who comfort them. Woe to those who steal from the poor, the poor widows in this case as we read it, but blessing to those who comfort them. So look at verse 14. Woe to, to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive a greater condemnation. You devour widows' houses. So when a, 
widow lost her husband and maybe her, or her son or her children. She is grieving and she has no, no spiritual protection over her. And sometimes the religious leaders would come and they would deceive the widow and say, I'll do this and this for you. And then they end up stealing her property or her belongings. It seems like that's unfair. How could somebody treat a widow like that? But that's, that even happens in our time today. But G Jesus, in contrast, he says in, in, five, in Matthew 5, 4, he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the ones that mourn with the widow instead of trying to devour her, uh, everything she has left, which is probably the only thing she has to live on, and they want to take it from her. But remember how James said, he said, pure and undefiled religion is, before God the Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. To visit not just the widows but also the orphans and take care of them. And I can only comfort someone who is mourning when I went through something and I trusted in God's love to, to instead of the, what the world has to offer. And then I can offer them comfort. So number three is, woe to those who use zeal for selfishness, but blessing to those who use it for God's glory. So let's look at verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. It's hard to imagine Jesus, the Lord of love, to use such strong terminology to call them the sons of hell. But think about this. Those people that were making converts, they themselves they had no life in God. Maybe they just knew of the religious system, and then they convert those people that absolutely know nothing about God, and they become even worse than the ones that converted them. So they become twice as bad as their disciple or their leader. And, they, and we see how God is speaking against this. Jesus is saying, do not be like that. Because they had zeal, but it was zeal that was not restrained by the Holy Spirit. Because a false religion, those who want to convert someone... Not, they, they do not know God himself and they can't really offer something that you do not have. We can't offer somebody what we do not have ourselves. So we know that zeal is a good thing, but if it is not controlled by the Holy Spirit, it can be very, very uh, devastating, just as we see what happened in Saul of Tarsus. He was a prime example because he was leading what he thought was an honorable deed to kill the whole, all the Christians. He wanted to destroy the, the faith. He thought he was serving God, but we know that what he was doing was going against God. And until Jesus Christ revealed himself to him, he thought he was doing a good thing for God. So he, Apostle Paul, uh, Saul, he had that zeal, and when he became Apostle Paul, he continued the same zeal but now to spread the gospel. So zeal is not a bad thing. It just has to be under control, control of the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at what Jesus says in, in the Sermon on the Mount, 5, 5, Matthew 5.5. 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness, but it's power under control. And every time I read this uh, beatitude, I always think about Eli's dog, meek. Because um, the first time I saw the dog, I was really scared. I had no idea whether to run, to fight, or to, to hide somewhere, anywhere I could. But when you meet the dog, you realize he's uh, very strong but under control. So you realize there's nothing to be afraid of because he is strong but under control. Just like a, a horse that is a wild horse or a stallion that has never been trained is no, not useful to anybody but when it is broken and it is under control, somebody can ride it to do so much good. It, they can go places, they can fight in wars, they can uh, deliver things. So blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
So Jesus in the woe, he says they will inherit hell, but here he says they are inheriting earth, which not, not the physical earth, but the, the spiritual earth that is in the New Jerusalem or the hev heaven which we are inheriting. Because the, our, our inheritance is not here on earth, it is in heaven. So blessed are those who are inheriting the heavenly things that God offers. So this, uh, this power has to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. So now let's look at the fourth one. For, fourth one is, Woe to those who swear falsely, but bless, blessings to those who live righteously. This is another contrast here we see between what Jesus said to the Pharisees and to the, in the beginning in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's look at verse 16. 23.16, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obligated to perform it. Fools and blinds and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? I will not keep reading. There's more verses about this, but we get the idea that they, these people are acting like little children. Or maybe sometimes maybe you have children that are, are they're playing and when they say they will do something, they, behind their hands they hold their hands and they say, I was just kidding. So they kind of cross their fingers and say, ah, that, that means I do not have to keep my word. So these religious leaders are almost like children. They're saying, well, if I say it this way, I don't need to keep the word. But if I say it this way, then yeah, I'll have to keep it. So they're acting basically like immature children because they are full of lies. Their, their false religion is often full of lies, but true worshipers are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. And how great would it be if when we sing a song and instead of focusing on the people that are singing, we focus on the God who it is about, or when somebody's speaking the word of God that instead of focusing on the actual person delivering it, but what is being said that we could focus on what God wants to do in our lives. Now look at the, the Beatitude, Matthew 5, 6. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. So the question is, what are you filled with? And are you filled with the righteousness and truth? Now, I would like to read one of the Psalms that speak very perfectly to what we were just discussing. It's Psalm 106, 3. Just one verse here. It says, Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness all the time. And he who does righteousness all the time. Instead of being... Uh, and, and off and on, just a Sunday Christian doing good just on when we're here together, but being somebody that does righteousness all the time. That's what God wants from us. Instead of, uh, like, he's, he gives the woe and says, Woe to you blind, the, the one that are just swearing things that mean nothing to you, but to, to speak truth and, and to have this uh, truth be filled inside of you. The truth of God's word. And now let's look at number five. So number five is, Woe to those who focus on the minors, but blessing to those who focus on God. So let's look at verse 23 and 24. So it says here, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. So here we see that Jesus is not rebuking them for tithing. They were very specific in how they did it. They didn't just get us scoop of uh, grain and give this to the church or to the widow. They, they, each grain, they divided specifically nine, uh, nine to me, one to, to the, the temple, or nine to me, one to the, 
to the, uh, to the widow or to the orphan. They were very specific, but God is rebuking that they, they, they forget the heavier things, the things that matter, which is justice, mercy, and faith. That's what God truly cares about, not about how much we give or, or, or the, the percentage of what we give, but how our heart is, whether it's in right relationship with him. And Jesus also said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. I did not desire mercy but sacrifice. I desire mercy and not sacrifice is what Jesus said. So in other words, he's saying, I desire a relationship, not a religion. And that's what he's rebuking them here for. And, and we see here it says, Jesus says that they strain out a gnat, which is a, a small uh, mosquito, which is the smallest uh, uh, creature that is unclean for the Jew. The Hebrew was not to, to eat or not even to touch, I guess, the, the mosquito so they would take it out with a very uh, specific way. They would strain it out so they will not defile themselves. Yet it says, Jesus says they swallow the camel, which is the largest uh, animal, which is unclean. So he is saying you, you do all these little things, but you forget the heavy things, the things that really matter, which is to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to serve your neighbor as you would serve yourself. So let's look at the beatitude of this now. That's Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. See the correlation between these two? Jesus is talking about mercy in the woe, and here he's talking about being merciful in the beatitude to also re receive mercy. We cannot receive something we do not give, or we cannot receive something we do not possess ourselves. So do we offer forgiveness and love to our neighbor or do we gossip and slander about somebody? So if a person will not forgive, then Jesus said that he will not be forgiven by God the Father. So blessed are the merciful, so they shall, uh, uh, for they shall obtain mercy. So number six, woe to those who are clean, uh, woe to those who are clean, outside, but blessing to those who are clean at heart. Woe to those who are clean outside, but blessing to those who are clean at heart. And we see that in verse 25 and 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you cleanse the outside of the, of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of exhortation and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish that the outside of them may be clean also. So what defiles a man is not what goes inside the person, but what comes out of the heart. That's what Jesus is saying in other words here. So the legalists put a heavy emphasis on the external, but Jesus is focusing on the heart's condition here. He's saying it's good to be clean on the outside, but first and primarily should be clean on the inside, and that's something that only Jesus can do by giving us new heart and new tra uh, transform us into uh, the likeness of Jesus Christ and to his image. So now let's look at the beatitude here, Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the poor at heart, for they shall see uh, the pure at heart. I'm sorry. For the pure at heart is the one that is clean heart, right? So he, Jesus is saying you clean the outside, but the inside is left unclean. But here in Matthew 5, he's saying, blessed are you when your heart is clean, when it is, has a new trans, transformation and when God can be seen through you. And God, you will see God, and people will see God in you also. So the pure heart is the one that is clean from lusts of the world and of this flesh. And when we think about gold, when we find gold in the ground, it, 
it has so many imperfections and impurities. And if you just take a, a chisel and start uh, pounding maybe the, the rocks or anything that is other than gold, it will never become clean because it will, it's so much inside it. And the only way to, to separate the impurities is to melt it, to put it into the refiner's fire. And that's what it, it purifies us. And so God's, God puts us through these trials to purify us, to make us more like Jesus. So blessed are the pure at heart, for they will see God. So number seven, woe to them that are dead inside, blessing to those that are dead to self. Woe to them that are dead inside, but blessing to those that are dead to self. When we die to ourselves, that's the condition God wants to see in us. So let's look, look at verse 27 and 28. So woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So in those days, there, there were tombs, especially in Jerusalem, that were in caves, and oftentimes they were not distinguishable from other, uh, just a regular cliff, I guess. So, so they would uh, put this whitewash kind of a paint substance on them, Baruski, Pabilit. Whenever I lived uh, in my grandmother's house uh, back in Russia, she would, they would take this, white substance, and they would paint the walls. And it wasn't really paint. It was just made a little bit brighter. But it was this substance that made, distinguished the, the grave so that, that the traveler or somebody that does not know that there is a grave there, they would know, this is a grave, do not touch it. So in a, a, it, the grave on the outside is beautiful. It is made white, kind of clean. But the inside, it's hard to even imagine what's going on in, inside with that body that is rotting. That's what Jesus is trying to say. And the reason they did that is so that in accidentally touching that tomb, the traveler will not become unclean, and then he will not be able to partake in the rituals of the religion that they were traveling so far to do. So Jesus is saying, you do all this, but you have to focus on what's inside. That's what's important. Now let's look at the beatitude of the, the contrast of what Jesus is saying, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So the, we know that only b the blood of Jesus Christ can make us clean. So we know that the ultimate peacemaker is Jesus Christ. And then he calls us, who are the followers of him, also peacemakers when we tell others about the ultimate peacemaker, which is Jesus Christ. And the only way we can be cleansed is through the pouring of the blood of Jesus Christ, who will wash us and make us pure. And that's why he's saying, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker. We can only say uh, to somebody that we do not know, I, 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 we can point them to the peacemaker, and he will give, give us peace to those to the one who is our peace. Jesus Christ is our peace. And no one else can change us into being called the sons of God. And the last one before we finish is number eight. So woe to them who persecute and blessings to them who are the persecuted. Woe to them who per persecute and blessings to them who are the persecuted. So Look at the final two verses here, verses 29 and 30. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of of the prophets. And you can continue reading to the end if it's interesting to you. We, we, we don't have enough time to develop this whole idea. But Jesus is saying, 
that you, you, you say that if I was to tr be transported into the time of Zacharias, into Isaiah, all the prophets that were killed, we wouldn't kill them. We would be holy. We would, uh, we would uh, not be partakers in this blood that was shed. That's what these Pharisees and hypocrites were saying. But let's think about what's going on in this situation. So this is just a few days before Jesus was to be crucified. And who was crucifying him? It was the, the same ones that are saying, we, will, we would have not partake in the blood, the spilling of the blood of the prophets, but they are pouring the, they're going to pour the blood of the most high prophet, Jesus Christ, the one that the Father sent in the holy place in Jerusalem. They will, they will destroy him. They will they take the whips and beat him half to death and then crucify him just outside of Jerusalem. These same prophets that said, we will not be partakers of this blood of the prophets. So we see the hypocrisy that is going on here. And we see that Jesus is giving them a chance to repent, to repent from their sins. But I think this was the one sermon that Jesus gave that, you know how we sometimes say, that broke the, uh, the camel's back, the straw that broke the camel's back. Because after this sermon, they were absolutely furious and did anything possible to, to kill Jesus. There was no chance of letting him go for another year or anything. They wanted Jesus dead because he rebuked them so strongly and it touched them so personally that they wanted Jesus dead. And let's look at the final beatitude of Matthew 5.10. It says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we see Jesus is talking about persecution in, in 23, and then he's talking about the, that we will be the persecuted ones. And when we are persecuted, it's a blessed condition because when we l truly live and, and show people, lead people to the peacemaker, we will be persecuted. We will be laughed at, mourned, uh, scoffed, and ridiculed because we lead people to the way, and they, people that do not choose to follow Jesus, they want to walk in their own ways. But when we realize that you are broken and in need of a Savior, that is the moment that we, we will truly become mocked and ridiculed by all those around us. But we know that brokenness is a heart of repentance, and Jesus wanted even those Pharisees to repent, but they did not see their need in a Savior. They they thought they, the way things were going were fine. They just wanted to keep on bringing the sacrificial lamb like they always did. But God saw that the only way that he, we could be right with God is if the perfect sacrificial lamb would be offered. And that's exactly what was taking place here. That Jesus was being, uh, in a way, vetted or checked for his uh, purity like a... a a lamb would be taken, and for a whole week it would be tested to make sure that there's no imperfections. And Jesus was being tested. He was asked questions about taxes, about the resurrection, about other things. Uh, he was being tested, and he was found to be pure, and he was found to be the perfect sacrificial lamb of God. So in conclusion, I would like to read the same verse we read again from the beginning at Deuteronomy 30:19. That's when Moses says to the people, he says, I have said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. Therefore, choose life. So today we have to make a choice about God, about Jesus Christ. He is the king that entered into Jerusalem as we, we see this wonderful decoration here. But he, is he the king of your life? Is he the king that cleanses us from all our sin? Or is he just a person that lived 2,000 years ago that we look up to as a good teacher, or is he truly the king of kings and the Lord of lords? So the decision you make about Jesus today will either determine whether you will have the blessings of Matthew 5, or rejecting him, you will have the woes or the curses of Matthew 23. And God forbid that anybody would purposely want to choose to live in a condition of uh, being cursed because they are rejecting 
the only way of salvation. So may, may the name of the Lord be blessed. We have an opportunity to pray together. Amen. Let's pray.